And of course, they were all, all we know when we hear uh, on a daily basis now that they, they discovered the remains of the, of the missing persons, and we know that in Gaspraxandos there were hundreds of them buried. We know even our own Giga's brother, Yorgos Dragos, was recently, uh, his remains were recently found there. Many of them were executed and buried there. But by God, by the Almighty's will, Therakon Constantinus survived. And he told his story for us to know. And it is already in a book called Escape from Hell. Apothrasi Abodingolasi. I think today and at every opportunity we have to commemorate these people. And we have to commemorate those that gave their lives for freedom. Because for the Greeks and for the Hellenes, freedom means a hell of a lot. I now will fast forward and we come to today's events. I don't, uh, uh, I don't know how much time I've got here, uh, but I've got a lot to say. Um, contrary to what, actually, we know why the, the big powers didn't come forward after many, many years of being at universities and uh, uh, following the Cyprus issue. They didn't come because they had their hand in it. Because the Americans, Kissinger, Cole, the British, the Foreign Office, they were all behind what was befalling to our beloved little island. They gave the green light to Turkey, or as Ejevit said, they didn't give me the red light. So they were all involved in the destruction and devastation of Cyprus. Contrary to what the Foreign Office and many others are trying to convince us, the Cyprus issue, it's not a problem between two squabbling communities between the Greek Cypriots and the Turkish Cypriots. It is a problem that has been created to serve the interests and firstly of Turkey for a, a total Turkification of the island and for those above mentioned superpowers to have control in the Eastern Mediterranean, to have a hotspot so they can step in at any given time, to have control of the entire area have control and access to the rich wells or oil, oil wells in the Caucasus and in all the areas around Asia. Today we still know that we are still alone. They still haven't come because those interests haven't changed. But some things have changed, and this is, I'm arriving to where I want to be. A lot of things have changed. Um, last week I was privileged, or two, three weeks ago, to be at the lecture by Dr. Klerkos Kyriagidis, and I'm sure he will say some of these things here tonight. Things have changed. Balance of power is changing. Um, although, the same power, so, so, although the same players are still involved, the US is no longer the power that it used to be. At least this is what I believe. This is what I read. There is a huge current account deficit in the United States. Its industry is in, it's in decline, in terminal decline. There is a huge budget deficit in every individual state. There is very high unemployment. I think the figures are something like 11%. Not to mention the failures in Iraq, in Afghanistan, financial crisis and so on. And all of these things are having an impact on America and the way it views the world around it. Um, other players like Great Britain are at the doorstep of bankruptcy, Greece the same. And the first casualties of, 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 of financial crisis like this is military investment and so forth and so forth. On the other hand, Turkey is on, is on a massive ascendancy. It's, it has a massive industrial potential. It has a rate of growth of around 6%, I believe, one of the largest in the world after China. 
and the Southeast Asia, he has a large and ever increasing population, mainly young, young people. So, again from the talk by Glerkos, we can see that there is a shift in powers, we can see that Turkey is calling a lot of tunes, we know from recent events in the area, the uh, Israeli situation, the flotilla uh, conflict, the, um, the relationships developed between Turkey and Iran, there are conflicts between the superpowers, traditional ally, Turkey. The question that I want to ask myself, and as a refugee, is that what, what, what does all this mean? I mentioned earlier about aspirations. I, mean, I mentioned about our dreams. And of course these dreams and these aspirations are all about returning home. They're all about picking up our title deeds and returning back, not as visitors, but as owners. And we know there are negotiations going on. We know that there is a lot going on at the moment. And are those aspirations and are those dreams going to be fulfilled? Is it the right time? Is the international scene, the international arena fertile for a settlement? And having, having said all these things, my personal opinion as a refugee, and I say what I say, I should have said at the beginning, these are personal opinions, it's not lobby for Cyprus policy, I don't represent any organization. I personally believe it is not the right time for a city. I personally believe that we are under immense pressure to make further concessions. And what is there more to concede on? What else do we have to give? We have given almost everything. The other side has given nothing. In 1974, we have lost 37% of our country. We are now being asked, not asked, we are being forced to accept certain settlements that in my humble opinion will put a big question mark the existence of the Republic of Cyprus, will put a big question mark to the existence of Hellenism where it prospered and thrived for thousands of years. Because if we, are, if we have a settlement where the weak has absolutely limited rights, where we lose mo most of the freedoms, most of the human, legal and moral rights that are enjoyed by the rest of the European compatriot, or not compatriots, or fellow citizens, then I have this fear that in years to come, we will not be campaigning for the restoration, for our return to the occupied part of Cyprus. We will be campaigning for the survival of Hellenism in Cyprus.